Hello, ye weary listeners. <laughs> Hello, weary listeners. <laughs> We're talking some more. <laughs> oh, that's funny. No, I'm sure they're not. If you're listening, you're probably not weary. You're probably not tired of my voice yet, right? You're listening, so just why don't you just go ahead and turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> weary listener. We just lost Montana. <laughs> yeah, the first thing I'd like to do is invite you to turn it off. Okay. Anyway, uh, it is time yet hither and once again for I didn't sign up for this. And we are all gathered here together as we usually do. And now it's time to say something <laughs> profound. Man, I'm in a goofy yes. mood. I can't help it. I'm like goofy. Anyway. That's Okay. What are we talking about? Hey, Tim, I would like to talk about the fact that we get trapped in our own thought processes and our own heads sometimes. Okay. And I'm the worst at it. I will, I, w I like to analyze things so much that I will build a story based on the analysis of a situation and it could be one side of the spectrum or the other side of the spectrum. And then I get stuck in the story that I tell myself. And, and, and it can be a good story or it can be a bad story. So I'm not really talking about a negative thing yet. But we all tell ourselves stories and we all get caught in our own belief systems and our own thoughts and the things that impact our actions and, and truly our actions are reactions to our belief system and our thought process. And right. I think you've even mentioned in previous podcasts, we all tell a story. So absolutely. There's always, there's always, a, there are always three sides to every story, right? There's his, hers and the truth they say, but right. um, I am infamous for pulling back from a situation, being able to analyze it, make assumptions, and then take action based on those assumptions. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. And I started thinking about that today because I've done a lot of, a lot of that lately. I've been in my own head quite a bit because I'm trying to figure out the changes that I need to make in my own life to take things to the next level for myself. And, you know, okay. maybe it is a hazard of the job or the fact that I am a life coach and there are so many opportunities and so many options out there. And I'm a person that likes to know all my options. But what I want to talk about is more than anything is how we let go of limiting our negative, negative beliefs. So let's say that you have someone that you're coaching who has a goal and they really want it. They wish they had it, but they want it. But the thing that's preventing them from taking action to achieve the goal is the story that they tell themselves or the belief system that they're stuck in. And that can go round and round until it turns into this limiting behavior and this limiting belief. And then you feel like you're missing out on what you truly want. And I want to talk to people tonight about how we overcome that because a lot of the things that that leads to is worry and despair, maybe a sense of not being worthy, and then hopelessness. And those are all things that are detrimental to your spirit and to the people that you come in contact with. For better or worse, um, believe what you want to, and I'll believe what I want to. Everybody always does anyway. Um, we crave a story to every situation, right? Somebody dies, that's not enough. We got to find out how they died. Right. The obituary doesn't say how they died. So we were digging in, you know, looking on police reports. We're just like watching old news segments. I've just got to know how it happened. Now, that person who died, are they ever coming back? No. Not in this life. Not as we understand it. Right. They're not going to be sitting down to Sunday dinner with you or whatever. But it is our innate curiosity we have to know the backstory. The hows and whys of things are so much more important than the, the, the what of it, okay? 
And so that you're right in assuming that's exactly what we do. We assume we look at a particular situation and we start telling ourselves a backstory that makes sense to us because we can't have all the information without an inordinate amount of research. And even then we likely can't have all the information. And so we make some fundamental assumptions that may or may not be correct. And we build our entire plot of our entire story on fundamental assumptions that can just as easily be wrong as they are right. And because of that, we're completely off our rocker most of the time <laughs> with the decisions we make and, and what we do. Okay. So that uh, kind of begs the question, how do we overcome the stories that we have told ourselves? Right. So we have an event, we interpret it negatively. We tell ourselves a story to explain why, why it happened, why it's our fault or why it's not our fault or why it's God's fault or the devil's fault or Jimmy Carter's fault or somebody's fault. Right. We've got to blame somebody and somebody has got to be held accountable. That seems to be a part of the human condition. And so then you have to ask yourself, okay, but that's cool. That's awesome. But I've created this story. I've adopted this story that I've created and now it's hurting me. It's keeping me from taking the actions that I need to take to be able to get to where I want to be. So there is a nice, clean, easy, simple system for changing that, that most people never hear about or execute. It goes back to things we've talked about before. You've got to consider the human brain. It's a really complex, really simple machine. Okay. It's, it's, it's the most complex thing that we've ever seen on the planet. The human brain is, and yet at the same time, it is incredibly predictable, right? That was the plop, plop, fizz, fizz reference, right? Anybody right. over 30, yeah. if I say plop, plop, fizz, fizz, what do you say? Oh, what a relief it is. <laughs> That's right. Because we've, we've been conditioned to attribute it to this over the counter medicine, Alka-Seltzer. So everything in our lives is that way, believe it or not. We are Pavlovian dogs. The bell rings and we salivate. Knowing this about ourselves, the bell is always something different and the salivation is always something different, right? Right. Knowing this about ourselves, we can slowly change both the trigger mechanism and the response. So imagine for a minute, the alarm goes off 4.45 in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. Cause you got to get up super early, get in a shower, drive two hours into work or whatever. You know, most people tell themselves a story about how difficult that is and how unfair that is. And so when the alarm goes off, they have a very negative response to that sound immediately floods your whole body with cortisol and you're very distressed and upset and life sucks. And that's what you wake up with every morning of your life. If you're an over the road commuter, like so many people are down in that area. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you could condition yourself to respond to that noise and that event in a different way where you jump out of bed singing zippity doo dah, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't think that that's even possible, but it absolutely is. Yeah. I agree with that. I believe that I, I believe that the majority of people would not try that. Um, I was reading a book not too long ago, and one of the chapters was on really changing and shifting your belief system and, and looking for opportunities to see abundance in your life and the things that would make you happy and having hope. And because for me, and in, in my opinion, hope is one of the first things that you need. You need to have hope. And, and that plays along with faith and faith in yourself and faith in your ability or faith in a higher power any of that. They all, they all go together. But anyway, I was reading this book and this chapter was let's reprogram your mind. So every morning for the next 30 days, get up and listen to one of the following songs and listed out all of these very, very happy songs. And so you could pick a song or you could use all of the songs or you could pick your own, but it had to be motivational and it had to be upbeat. And it was a great exercise because especially if you set that song as your alarm and then you wake up to that song every morning and you realize you have that moment of recollection where you think about what you learned in the book and how you're trying to change and shift your, your belief system to be happier and to be more motivated. And, um, 
and it was very interesting and it's very easy to do. So it's sitting right in front of yeah. you as a very easy tool, but no one picks it up. And why do you think that is? Because of the lack of hope or faith that it would work. So if you're in a position today and there you want to be in a different position in the near future, 18 months out, far, you know, farther than that, whatever that looks like for you, whatever the time frame is, you have to have hope that you can get there and faith that you will put the actions into play to get you there. And so if you don't have hope or faith, you could be sitting right in front of a million dollars in a paper bag and pass it by. It's the same idea. Oh, that sounds nice though, doesn't it? Yeah, it really (laughs) does. I'm going to start picking up paper bags just to make sure. I hope there's a million dollars in there. Oh, I like I seriously that that was such a that was such a prevalent fantasy of mine as a young man. <laughs> Just you know how like when you're a kid, you uh-huh. know you're ten or twelve, and you tell yourself all these crazy stories. I actually wrote a story wherein I find a dead body down at the water, down at the the sound, off of the dock, off of the end of the the dock where my dad's house was, and the only thing keeping this dead half crab eaten body afloat is a backpack and i open the backpack and there's like a million dollars cash in there <laughs> that's awesome and the story goes on and on and on right but it's just interesting how so many of our projections or fantasies or whatever are just these universal stories right like what kid hasn't been terrified to go to seventh grade and felt like they weren't good enough and dreamed up some crazy backstory about how their family was European royalty. And, <laughs> you know, we have a castle in Scotland and it, it's just a cliche, right? Because it's so universal. It's just the way we deal with our fears, you know, God, it's just absolutely funny. Okay. Well, let's listen the, you'll get a kick out of this. So when I was about, what? Oh gosh, I would say seven or eight years old. Um, there were there were a lot of things going on in my family at that time, and we lived in rural North Carolina, in between two mm-hmm. towns, and we lived on. Oh gosh, I want to say it was like a half an acre. Like it was a pretty it was a pretty big lot, and um, that. So at the same time, we used to go to my grandmother's house in the summer and spend time with her. And she always had the TV on. It was always soap operas or, you know, whatever she was watching. She kept it on for the noise and and would sometimes sit down and watch it. But anyway, there was a peppermint patty commercial. And in the peppermint patty commercial, it was a contest. And you could win stuff in this contest. Well, that must have been about the age that I really started kind of paying attention to anything other than cartoons. And I remember one night I had a dream that I opened, I was in the backyard and I opened this peppermint patty and out flew my own house right in front of me. And I remember (laughs) walking into the house and I remember thinking, this is all mine. This is my home. And it was the funniest thing because if I look at that situation now, that was me making up for some of the deficits that we had in our going on in our lives during that same time. So I associated it with this contest and I was going to win a house. And I mean, I was that kid that wanted to grow up. If I, you know, I remember one time I had extra money and I told my mom that I was old enough to buy my own groceries at nine years old. So she took me to the grocery store and I bought some groceries. And when the groceries ran out, I realized that I wasn't quite ready to be an adult at nine years old. Because, you know, you can't buy that much with $10. <laughs> but, you know, it was a good experience. <laughs> she let me she let me test it out. She's like, all right, you want to do that? You can yeah. do that. Luckily, she didn't try to charge me rent. But um, <laughs> it's just it's just funny to me because that dream has stuck with me all these years as one of the funniest and most vibrant dreams I ever had. And it was all about me creating, I was going to win a home for myself. So it was never about money. It was about that security and tying down and having those roots. Right. And, you know, and, and that's something that I, I struggle with because of the, 
the conflict with adventure and and being up in the clouds and op, you know all of these different things but so roots are I always look for that because I want to be grounded and so it's kind of funny right. but that's the story that my brain told myself my you know seven or eight year old self that I was going to win this and it made me happy it's interesting right it is it's fascinating stuff it's interesting Largely, in order to make the changes in your life, you have to change your paradigms, your beliefs about certain things. And in order to change those beliefs, you have to go back and change the underlying story. But for some reason, there can't seem to be a story deficit, right? The most painful words in the world are, I don't know. I don't know what happened to him or her or that or it or whatever, right? Right. People always crave a story, so much so that it left to their own devices, even people who don't know and can't possibly know about given things in their life, you know, you give them four or five years, they'll tell you a really detailed story, you know, mm-hmm. because your brain is just in charge of finding answers to the questions you ask. You ask a question of it and it will find an answer. Absolutely. That's why you have to be so careful about the questions you ask. You know, if you're asking the question, why am I such a loser? Well, your brain will go find answers to that question to support the underlying hypothesis that you're a loser. And you will believe it. And you will build your story around that assumption just based on asking a really bad question because you happen to be down that day. You ask yourself a terrible question and you send yourself down a path that leads to more terrible reality, more terrible results. That's why the old adage is, as a man thinketh, so is he. Because it's absolutely true. And it's not hocus pocus, right? It's not voodoo. Right. It's just the way the human condition works. So if you can take your underlying story and essentially re-record it, we, we've talked about this before, right? Your your brain is like a... Uh, imagine your brain is a VHS cassette tape, okay? Mm-hmm. You have all of this input, sound, visual, kinesthetic, feeling, touch, whatever, right? All the five senses and whatever other senses are out there. You have this experience and you carefully record it. And then when you pull it out to play it... The, the playing mechanism doesn't play it accurately because it's memory-based. It's not straight across. And so essentially every time you tell your story, you re-record it, which means you can make minute and believable changes, which means every time you re-record the story, you can direct it in any direction you'd like to see it go. A more empowering direction. Well, isn't that the point of positive affirmations? I mean, you really are trying to reprogram yourself into Guy Smiley. I'm good enough and people love me kind of thing. You know, (laughs) do you remember that character on Saturday Night Live? I told someone I I was... I quoted it at dinner. Oh, that's funny. What is it? I'm good enough and I'm smart enough and gosh darn it, people like me. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough and gosh darn it, people like me. Um, anyway, I, I get that changing our belief system is important. And I would venture to say that even though I get in my own head probably quite a bit more than, than perhaps you do, I would say that we're both in a spot where we have the tools and the ability to do that. So if we're talking to people who have never, maybe this is a foreign thought to them and they've never contemplated changing their belief system or they or they don't even understand what exactly their hindering belief is. There's an exercise that I have done with someone who struggled with um, being unhappy and struggled with where she wanted to go in life and the limiting behaviors in a coaching session that, that she brought up and we started talking about. And so there was an exercise that I had her do where I had her write down every belief that she had about herself good or bad, indifferent, whatever those beliefs were. It could have been about her physical self. It could have been about her personality, her career, her, you know, her characteristics, her strengths, her weaknesses, whatever. And I just had her write down everything she believed about herself. And then from that list, 
I wanted her to mark the ones that were negative. And so once she marks the mark, the ones that were negative, I had her pick her biggest ones because honestly, in one session, you can't tackle every limiting belief that you have out there. So you circle five or circle three, find the top three. And I had her rewrite those statements in a positive way. And that's what I had her. I'm big on telling my clients to put stuff on their mirrors. And if any of my clients are listening to this, they're probably laughing at that because I tell them all the time, okay, so what do you, what do you want your next step to be? What do you, you know, what's your most valuable asset? How do you, what do you believe is best about you? What do people love about you? Great. Get a post-it note. I want you to put it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on your bathroom mirror so that you can see it every day. Put it on your fridge. Do whatever you need to do to put that up there so that you see it every day. And we all brush our teeth, hopefully. And so when you're standing in the bathroom and you're brushing your teeth, where do your eyes go? They go to all the post-it notes that you have on there. And so there are so many processes that are impactful and important to allow you to change the belief system. But I am an advocate of getting it on paper. When I need to sort through something and I'm telling myself a story and it makes me sad and I don't want to be sad because that makes me even sadder, I get it out on paper. And once I get it out on paper, I go, okay, it's just words on paper. I can change those. So it's a visualization that works really well. Um, Right. It's all about your perspective. You have to be able to shift your perspective and you have to be able to identify what is true and what is false. Now, on the flip side of that, let's say that you write, (laughs) let's say you're with me and you make a list. And in that list, you say, you know, I really don't treat my kids very well. I'm really hard on them. Is that a limiting belief or is that something that you can tie an action to? So that's a completely different thing. You can change the belief, but there are times where you have to take action and you have to be able to get that momentum and to be able to move through that. And so that's completely different than, than the limiting beliefs because nobody's perfect. And if you can sit down and truly be objective about who you are as a person and be honest with yourself, you may have something that is a belief about yourself that there are actions that you're doing today that contribute to that belief. And then you have to take that extra step and change those actions. I think it's important. And I I don't think, I I think that it's a, you know, it takes 21 days to change a habit. And I would say that it takes affirmations at least that amount of time to start believing them. But that's, you know, that's the purpose of affirmations. That's what we do. Well, and the only part that I would kind of stray from that notion is that, Affirmations are designed to adopt a given belief. At, at a, just one step deeper, that given belief is based on the story you told yourself to explain what's going on. I think you go a little bit deeper and change the underlying story simply by retelling it differently. And you do that incrementally and you change, you change the belief. And then, you know, an affirmation or a mantra is chanted to reinforce that. And I've seen that be very effective as well. But I start with the story. Why do I think this about myself or someone else or life or whatever? What is the underlying story? Because there's there's not a soul on this planet that could give you their belief about yourself, themselves. That you go to them and say, okay, interesting. Why do you feel that way? And here comes the story. They've got the story ready to rehearse. That's true. Mm-hmm. You know, they remember. Like when you were talking about the dream about the peppermint patty in the house and the whole thing, right? You didn't share the entirety of that story, but you had it right there at the ready. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's always more to it. But what the human brain is capable of doing is rehearsing the story and making changes. Now, most people do it subconsciously. You rehearse the story and you make little minute changes so that 20 years from now, you're still selling that same story about whatever happened back in the good old days. And it's scarcely even recognizable compared to the reality of what happened on that given day. 
right? Right. And so because the brain does this inherently, you can use that as a power. That's, that's a superpower because I can rehearse the story of when I was in that wreck or I, whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever that limiting, wherever that limiting belief came from or whatever that backstory is, I can go back and rehearse that story intentionally changing small points of it. And I do that enough to the point that the reality of what happened is now not even recognizable, but the new story is incredibly empowering. Right. I mean, it goes, it goes back to the underlying notion of, are we really even here? Okay. And I don't want to get too deeply steeped in the philosophy of all of that, because that's a, you know, big can of worms. That's a barrel of worms. Right. But if you ask yourself the question, am I really here or am I just projecting consciousness into this experience? Okay. And uh, we've another, again, we've talked about this before, I think privately, but I was reading a study out of MIT where the scientists in question were treating uh, Iraqi war victims who had lost limbs. And what they did was they built a bionic limb that would attach to this guy's body. It was a left arm in this particular case. And they built a left arm for this guy, went up over the stump, and then there's a little belt configuration that connected it to his body so that he could take advantage of the electronics inside the arm. And then they ran what amounts to uh, an HDMI cable from the arm into the guy's brain and went right to the, that part of the brain that handles motor function, handles the arm. And because of neuroplasticity, this guy was able to think about it long enough and hard enough that he began to be able to control and manipulate this electronic limb. And he could reach and grab things and he could tell you if something was hard or soft. He could tell you if it was hot or cold. He was interpreting through this device. Okay. So time moves along. So does technology. We have this thing called Bluetooth. These same MIT uh, doctors, professors, and what have you get together and say, hey, I wonder if we could eliminate the cables altogether and just put like a little Bluetooth connection in his brain and have an exterior Bluetooth connection connected to the arm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they pulled the wires out. They inserted the little Bluetooth device, zipped him up, closed his head up entirely. The Bluetooth would broadcast out to the arm. And again, it took some retraining, but once he was very adept at it, um, he was able to manipulate the arm. He could squeeze, tell you hard or soft, hot or cold. He could, you know, move it, pick stuff up, clap with his other hand, all kinds of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where it gets really interesting. That Bluetooth signal has about a 30 foot range on it. One day, uh, in the interest of rest and a little bit of talcum powder, he's got the arm completely detached. When some of the grad students who were working on the project and writing about, about the project asked him, well, that's kind of interesting. You have a 30 foot range. So could you, could you move the arm right now? And the guy's like, well, I don't know. Let's see. He thinks about it. And this uh, electronic arm goes crawling across the counter. <laughs> oh my right? gosh. Think cousin it in, you know, the monsters or not monsters, but the Adams, Adams family. family. Yeah. Cousin. It. Yeah. It wasn't cousin it. it. Who was the hand in the box? Oh, Whatever it was. It I doesn't matter. Remember. Anyway, the free moving hand in the box, he's thinking and his hand and arm is able to move and he can like crawl along the countertop. Right. So they put it on the floor and they're playing with this $50,000, $100,000 arm. Anyway, they're playing with this arm and they have him crawl across the floor and grab a ball and squeeze the ball. He said, so is the ball soft or is it hard? It's like, well, it's kind of soft, but you can feel it. Yeah. All right. Let's go over here and grab this glass of water. All right. Got it. Now, is the water hot or cold? Well, it's, it's quite warm, but you can tell for sure, right? Yeah, absolutely. He can define what's going on. So 
What he's doing is he has got a conscientious receiver in his physical body, and he is projecting his consciousness through that arm, through that device, and it can perceive sensory input, right? Not even connected. So that That's beg- crazy. Not even connected, right? So that begs the question, if we can do it with the arm, and you've got this sense of touch, and, and you've got heat and cold, right? It's hard or soft, hot or cold, you've got a sense of touch. So what if you were to add a little camera to it and put another chip inside his visual cortex? Could the arm now see? Well, of course it could, up to 30 feet away or whatever technology they're using. The arm could see. So the arm could crawl across the floor into the other room and watch television. Sure, (laughs) why not, right? Why not? So now, if you add some type of microphone input and go to the auditory nerve center in the brain, the arm could now hear. It could walk in the other room, watch television, listen to the show, right? (laughs) (laughs) He never needs to get out of bed. Okay. And so basically what you're talking about is a robot, a fully functioning robot with sensory input that we can project our consciousness into, right? But then that begs the question, if you're going to do that, is a, a robot made of you know, steel and wires and copper and cables and batteries, is that the most efficient machine to project your consciousness into? Well, I mean, the answer is yes, because it's the only one we know how to build. All right. Mm -hmm. But suppose we could crack the case technologically where we could basically, you know, build a little clone. You grow your clone up and you put your receivers inside the brain of the clone and your transmitters inside your brain. And now you are conscientious through the clone and you're driving it around, right? It's walking around. It's going to work. It's, you know, mountain climbing or skydiving, things that you wouldn't want to do yourself because they're far too dangerous. You are projecting your consciousness into this other device, right? The problem with doing it with a robot, I mean... You know, it, it's plausible to think, given current technology, that we could project our consciousness into said robot and then fly that thing to Mars and have it walk around on the Martian surface and tell us what's there and, and what's going on. I mean, to some degree, we're doing that anyway. It's, not, it's just not a single person's consciousness wired directly to the brain, right? The little Mars rover, it goes around and it looks at things and listens and feels and touches and rolls around and and does what it does. And then it communicates that information back to us and we receive it on a a visual screen that we're looking at. Okay. So all you got to do is move the receptive device into the brain and have the transmitting device out there walking around. And do you pull your head up and look around on the surface of Mars? And I would, I would tell you, you do. You absolutely do. You're there. You've projected your consciousness into this robotic form that is out having an experience by proxy for you. Except the fact that robots break. You know, eventually it's going to take a tumble. So you need to figure out some way to make the robot self-healing. Robots also age and the batteries stop charging. They die off. Well, what if you could make the robot self-replicating? Mm -hmm. So you make the thing out of organic material, you have it self-heal as long as it possibly can, until ultimately it dies off. That's law of entropy, way of the world. But that's okay because there are more little robots there because they self-replicate. And you could project your consciousness into these little organic forms, these little fleshy robots. And you could make them look like, you know, bunnies or wolves or monkeys or humans. Make it into a human that could somehow breathe the Martian air, right? And then that begs the question, if we can do it, and we are doing it, and we can see what I'm talking about, it's it's 100 years off, maybe less, but we can see it from here, okay? And so if we can do it, you have to ask yourself the question, are we doing it already? Are we doing it right now? Are we in fact... And this is the merge, the blurring of the lines between philosophy and religion. Are we, in fact, somewhere else projecting our consciousness into these organic bots 
that walk about this planet and experience life and heal ourselves and procreate and we can live off of anything, almost anything on the planet we can shove in our faces and use as fuel, right? Are we doing it right now? Are we in fact somewhere else, whatever we are, are we in fact somewhere else engaged in this behavior through the medium of, of these physical bodies? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where to go with that. I mean, it's, it reminds me of the Bruce Willis movie, Surrogates. Do you remember that movie? That was basically the exact same concept. And very similar concept. And it was interesting because people would use that to go out and live their lives and they would sit at home and they weren't living, they were living vicariously through a device and it's, it's different. It's a different way to, to look at things and think about things. Um, I don't think we'll find the answer tonight. Um, but, <laughs> but it is an interesting thought. Well, the, the moral of the story, and that's a long convoluted way to get back to this notion. When you think about yourself thinking, right, who's actually doing the thinking, meaning are you a single entity or are you able to intellectually or spiritually or through consciousness remove yourself from the person, the body you live in and look at that body from a third perspective? Right. Because I think everybody does that. You know, when everybody talks about themselves, who's doing the talking, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. You know, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I need to work out or I need to lose weight or I need to get a job or I need to whatever. Okay. You, so you're looking at, at yourself saying this creature needs to do thus and such. Who's actually doing the talking at that juncture? It's a separate conscientious entity. Right. We're aware of the separate consciousness that's completely outside of brain and body, which means the brain is just an organ and organs like muscles, they can be trained, they can be managed, they can be told what to do. So when you think to yourself, what is my backstory? If you will simply think what story empowers me and adopt that story instead of what you think is the almighty truth, because that's really not such a thing, not from my perspective, Right. then stop asking yourself, is this the truth? And start asking yourself, am I getting closer to what I want by believing this? That makes sense. I think that, I think it's hard for people to, I mean, unless you're analytical by nature um, and you can be honest with yourself, I think it's hard for people to let go of the stories that they tell themselves. And, but it is possible. It just takes that retraining and it takes the opportunity to look at yourself. So here, here, here's the funny thing. If I look at myself through my own eyes, I see me. And I probably pay more attention to flaws than I do strengths, just like most everyone else. But what if I look at myself through my mom's eyes? Do you think she sees the same flaws? Of course not. No, she sees a child that she created that's grown up into a woman. And she sees all the beautiful things first. And and the strong right. things. And then... I would even venture to say that she doesn't even see half of the flaws or imperfections in my personality or, or me as a person that I might see. And and that actually is a behavior that you need to change in order to advance because you can't constantly focus on the gaps or what you feel like you're missing and gain that momentum to move forward into a better life. You're, you're creating a space where you're focused on the negative and not the positive. Right. And I would take it one step further once again and say, just lie to yourself. <laughs> well, just lie to yourself. Just tell yourself a more empowering story. Right. And that's an affirmation. Affirmations are little lies that are positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of. Well, no, but see, and that's the thing. If you're going to lie, go all in and say that the little lies are actually the truth that hasn't manifested itself yet. Right. Intention. 
Yeah, no, I get that. That makes sense. I don't I don't really think that affirmations are little lies. I just want to make that clear. But <laughs> what are the benefits of doing that? What is the benefit to changing the way we think versus thinking the way that's worked for us for, for however many years we've been on the planet? Okay. The key point to that question is work for us. If it's working for us, there's no need to change it. There's no incentive to change a story that's working for you. It's feeding into positive behaviors, getting you closer to what you want out of life. It's only the stuff that is holding you back that you need to change. And the benefit of changing that is setting yourself free to engage in the activities that bring you closer to what you've decided you want. And that, of course, all hinges on, you know, the same old drum that I beat all the time, deciding what you want. You'll never have it till you decide what it is. Right. Well, and I, I think that we visited that and, and how to do that. I think the, the last piece of it, because I can make a list of what I want and I can prioritize them. But if I truly don't believe in myself enough to really get there, I'll never get there. And so that's where the, the mental shift comes from. Okay, but it's because you'll only never get there because you won't take any action to get there. Because you don't believe you can have it. And so you haven't made a list of wants, you've made a list of wishes. No, that makes sense. And wishes are pretty benign creatures, right? Yeah, they are. That's true. That's true. Okay, that makes sense. So really, you're not making a list of wishes, you're making a list of wants. And if you're making a list of wants, then you have enough momentum behind those wants to be able to progress and go for it. Well, and then plus, will you actually even make a list of wants that you thoroughly do not believe you can have? Because by virtue of not believing you can have them, or that you deserve them or, or whatever, knowing you will take no action to attain the want makes it by definition a wish. And so it'll never even make it onto the list. You'll realize that's a wish. I wish I was a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like, okay, well, it's good to wish, but is it legitimately a want? No, I, I would dare say that's not a want in your life, brother. Yeah. Because if that was, if that was a want, there would be actionable items that you could engage in that you're not engaging in and haven't engaged in at all up to this point. And so let's, let's forego the wishes for a moment. That's great when it's you and a buddy and... You're hanging out, getting smashed, and talking about all your wishes. That's cool. And you enjoy that. But that's not what I'm here for. It's not what you're here for. We're talking about actually getting tangible physical results in a tangible physical world and finding a path to accomplishing these goals, which allow you to have these wants, not wishes, wants. Right. Well, and here's the thing. If you're moving in a positive direction... And you're changing your belief system to release the negative things that haven't worked for you. And you're moving into more of a positive space. There are a lot of even health benefits to that. Sure. Down to greater resistance to the common cold. <laughs> Literally says that sure. in an article that I read. And, you know, you, you have lower depression rates. You have lower distress. You're able to... You're able to live your life more fully in a positive space than you are a negative one. So if you want to be healthy, you have right. to start with thinking positive and moving into positive affirmations, positive belief systems. Live in a positive space. Okay, you might be wrong, but you're going to live longer and be happier. So <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and I, that's exactly, and I don't mean delusion, you know, I don't mean that, you know, I, I want to wake up tomorrow and have a wonderful husband and he's going to make me breakfast before I go to work. And, you know, I'm going to make a million dollars tomorrow kind of thing. You, you have to be realistic. You ha you have to be able to, it's okay to dream and it's okay to dream big. I'm a big fan of that, but you do have to be able to set the goal that is achievable for you. Well, and uh, you have to be able to see the path, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I think anybody can migrate from, you know, whatever their reality is now to an entirely new reality. But if you were to do that 
suddenly and literally? <laughs> I mean, what would happen if tomorrow morning some dude showed up <laughs> at the bedside with eggs Benedict on a tray and freshly squeezed orange juice? I'd probably love right? him forever. <laughs> like, I'd be a little freaked oh, out. You would not. I would... You'd be going, who the hell are you and how did you get in my house? <laughs> Why, honey, it's me. I'm your husband. You're all of a sudden husband. By the way, here's a million dollars. I've got you a million dollars. I broke it up into $100,000 in each paper bag because I know how meaningful that is to you. I got that other guy a million in a backpack off of a dead body. <laughs> it really stinks. I don't know why. I don't know why oh, he couldn't just no. take it in a paper bag. Anyway, no, but seriously, really, really. You'd freak out. You'd be like, what are you? Who are you? And why are you here? And where? where's my gun? <laughs> you know, it's just like, you're like freaking out. And so, so in, in short, I, I think like... There is a migratory path between where you are and where you want to be. And just like headlights on your car, you've got to be able to see that road. You've got to be able to see the path to actually traverse the path, right? You can't just wake up in some alternate universe. But, you know, uh, many would argue that there are an infinite number of alternate universes and you could, in fact, migrate slowly, progressively to an alternate Many explain this law of attraction by talking about the infinite multiverse. And once again, I'm getting off into the ethereal. And so I won't, you know, we're out of time anyway, oh. but so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you do a little bit of reading on it, it's like, okay, this is interesting. This, you know, this is interesting. It is interesting. Math is math, whether you understand it or not. Right. Right. You, you can't use the notion of, hey, well, I don't understand how that could be to say, well, that's absolute proof that it does not exist because it just it doesn't work. You can't prove a negative. Right. Well, and it's OK that there are things in this world that we can't explain and mysteries that we we truly don't have the answers to, although it's contrary to what our mind wants to do because we need a story. You have to have faith that even if you can't find a definite answer, that you're on the right track and you can see where you need to go. Because you're always going to have those unexpected turns and twists and the things that happen in your life. And, and it's okay because it's part of that, it's part of that journey to where you want to be. But I will tell right. you that if you face it in a positive manner and you believe in yourself and believe that you can achieve the things that you set out to achieve, you will. Like, that is simple math. You will. If you believe it, you will do it. That's right. So. That's absolutely right. And so if you can change the belief, which, again, is defined by the paradigm, which is defined by the stories you tell, you can manage your life into a great deal of happiness and success. Absolutely. You just got to be really careful about the stories you adopt, right? Like I saw, I saw an episode of How I Met Your Mother last night. And do you know the character? Are you yeah, familiar with the characters mm -hmm. of this show? Yeah. All right. So Marshall, big, tall, yeah. tall Marshall. Uh, Marshall talks about his problems with the dude in number two. He calls it reading a magazine at work, right? And you learn through the course of the entire show that it's because he's so self-conscious about defecating at work that he's quite sure everyone is silently mocking him, <laughs> right? And then later in the storyline, he comes to the conclusion that, hey, that's there's nothing wrong with defecating at work. That's just me time and... Everybody does it, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it in style, and I'm going to carry my magazine high and proud into the bathroom, right? And once he makes this decision, then his entire paradigm shifts, and now he hears everyone silently approving of him and his confidence <laughs> and his ability to go boop at work, right? Yeah. And there is just a lot of truth in the, the moral of that story. There's a lot of truth. You define, you tell yourself a story, you define 
you know, what you are based on what you're looking for and the explanation you give yourself. And so if you think people are talking behind your back, you'll behave as though they are. And then pretty soon they will be because they can't understand why you're behaving as though they're talking about <laughs> That's you. That's so true. And so they're gathering around the water cooler to say, hmm, I wonder why he's acting like we're talking about him. I don't know, but I saw it yesterday. <laughs> Let me tell you what he did. Okay, well, you're, you're talking, talking about, about him. Now, so you've right? actually made that happen. He made that mm -hmm. happen with his behaviors. And the behaviors were manifest through the story he told himself. Well, you find what you look for. Everybody does You find it. what you look for. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Everything is here. Everything you need. You find what you look for. Don't look for the bad stuff. Right. Just don't look for the bad stuff. There's no reason to find it. I agree. You will find it if you look for it, though. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Somebody trying to screw me out of a job. Is somebody... You know, is my significant other cheating on me or whatever, you know, you look for that long enough, you'll, you'll find it. Well, and I think that intuition plays a vital part in the decisions that we make too. You have to be able to listen to the inner voice. And I don't mean the inner voice that nags at you. I mean, the inner voice that's there to support you because everybody has to, everybody has that, you know, yeah. Debbie Downer inner voice that is going to, that's going to tell you, you can't do something. It's kind of like the angel and the devil, right? Well, everybody has the angel too. You have to be able to get to the point where you can cheer yourself on because there may not be anybody else cheering right. you on sometimes. And you have to be able to carry that and take accountability into consideration and, and know that this is your life and you have the ability right. to create your life exactly the way that you can envision it. There are no accidents and... Everything will fall into place if you will be open to it and look for the positivity. So there you go. Makes sense. And I want a bionic arm now just to freak people out. <laughs> I mean, in addition to my two. The, the thing is, if you think about it, we're already doing it on so many levels, right? I mean, you're, you're looking at your phone as your little $150 drone goes skyward. And you're looking down at the world with a bird's eye view. We're doing it right now. It's just the hardwired is not implanted into our brains the way it was with this guy with the lost arm. But once we cross that threshold, then we will be, in my opinion, creatures projecting our consciousness into these bodies, which is in turn creating other bodies to project our consciousness into. And when that drone creates another drone, <laughs> <laughs> then we have that's, the Terminator. <laughs> that's, when time be, that's when you get nervous. Oh, that's exactly that's right. Interesting. Interesting. Because that's the day the robots take over. Skynet, was it? Yeah. John Connor. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, that's Skynet. <laughs> that's Skynet. Well. All right. We should wrap it up. I guess we'll be back. We'll be back. And remember, you are conditioned to respond. And so if you will give yourself the signals, the ringing of the bell in Pavlov's world equaled the salivation of the dog, well, you can decide what the ringing of your bell sounds like. <laughs> and you can decide what your response is. And if you condition, <laughs> do you have to go there? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I was so good without laughing and then you you have to go there if you know what the ringing of your bell sounds like yep <laughs> i gotta tell you it's been a while since i had my bell rung <laughs> uh, uh, anyway Oh, goodness. I think I'm blushing. Remember, we are conditionally responsive creatures. Like, if I were to say to you, I will give you another phrase and you respond, okay? Uh -huh. Dream your life. And live your dreams. Amen. We're out. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ring my Bye -bye. bell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Bye. Bye.